Today's workshop or boot camp, uh, decisions, decisions, basically what makes a good hit, what makes a good lead, and later on, um, uh, why do you write a TPP, uh, which is, um, I'm never sure, so we're going to learn about it from <laughs> later on, and how do you write one. Um, so I will continue with this. Uh, we're going to start with some short talks by me. Uh, I was in um, at, I was at Merck. Uh, I worked there for 21 years in antibacterial discovery, and in 2004, I started my own um, consulting uh, company in this, in this field. I'll be talking about early discovery and HIT validation. Then Tim Waddell, who's a medicinal chemist, he was at Merck also, and now he's at Prokaryotics. He'll be talking about medicinal chemistry and why that's sort of not different. That's different from organic chemistry, somewhat. Uh, and Tom Doherty, who was at Pfizer and then AstraZeneca and now at uh, Harvard Medical School. And he'll be giving more background and case histories. And then John Tomiko, who was at GSK and Sparrow, and he's going to be talking about the target pro product profiles, TPPs. So continue from there. Then, um, uh, then we'll have panel, a panel discussion, but I'm afraid we're not going to have too much time for that, so I might ask a couple of questions of the panel. But we're then we'll try to um, answer some of the questions that, as John said, you guys will be asking. So that's really what we'll, how we'll spend the second half of the talks. OK. So there are a variety of discovery strategies one might use. They may be directed towards targets, you know, your enzyme, your favorite enzyme, how do I inhibit it, and find compounds, chemicals that inhibit those targets. Um, and there's also empirical screening, kill the bug screening, the way that almost all of the antibiotics that are in use were found. So even though it's sort of a, looking at serendipity, that's the way most things happen, so don't thumb your nose at it, it's important to think about. Um, now each approach has adherence, people want to do screening their own way, uh, and as I said, empirical screening was the source of almost everything, but target-based screening seems more rational, so that's a nice way of going, because we're all scientists, but actually, let's take it under advisement. Uh, basically, you can get hits pretty easily, you can kill bacteria pretty easily, but Neither an enzyme inhibitor nor a bactericidal compound is a drug. It takes a long time to get to a drug. It's not even a lead compound. It's just a hit. And that's really what we're trying to do here and I'll talk about today is how to get from a hit to a lead and maybe to a candidate compound. And it takes many steps to qualify a hit as a lead and many more to, to keep going into the clinic. So uh, as I said, you'll find them by various methods, but each path that you take to, to getting a hit then sets up a different sort of strategy for f following it through. Almost each path, er, each path has almost the same kinds of questions that you'll have to answer, but not necessarily in the same order, so that's sort of interesting. And this is the key slide from my talk. Uh, there are three scenarios for hit generation I'll talk about that, say, from synthetic libraries, could be from natural products as well, but let's just talk about synthetics. You can screen for a target inhibition in vitro. Look for your enzyme, do biochemical screens. That's a high throughput screening robotic setup. Or you can do whole cell directed phenotypic screens. And that's, that's basically you set up a whole cell screen that asks a specific question that will be turned on by a hit of a certain target or a pathway. And in this case, these were uh, underexpression. Uh, so we're underexpressing the gene FAB, uh, uh, fab F in staph, and in this one, this is the wild type levels, and it picks up inhibitors of FABF, which are here thiolectomycin and serulinin, and here on the underexpressing strain, and here they're not showing up, and then it turns out that that guy over here was showed up on that strain, but not this strain here, and that turned out to be platensomycin, which is a compound that does specifically inhibit FABF. Okay, but this is the more general empirical screen to find does it kill a cell? Do you have a compound that kills a bacterial cell? This is in a microplate format, but you can certainly do it on agar plates, et cetera. So this is, as I said, how almost everything was found. But what do you do next? Well, there's a bunch of steps in each case. And if you'll notice first, the first step in all of them is you look at the chemical and you say, is that any good? 
Uh, if it's in a chemical library, you're going to ask questions about is it reproducible, is it really what you think it is, et cetera, and you ask a chemist because I can't tell you what it is and you can't figure it out. You really need to know a medicinal chemist to, to address these questions, and that's why Tim is here to talk about some of the ways that chemists look at these things. Um, but we also ask other parts, and there's other important things to know. As I said, most of these um, steps are in common, but for this one, where you're looking at an enzyme inhibitor, you ask, does it kill cells? Does it have an MIC, minimal inhibitory concentration? A lot of times, those inhibitors in the test tube, which work fine on your enzyme, just don't work on bacteria. Why not? Well, sometimes it doesn't get into the cell. In fact, many times. Otherwise, maybe you pick the wrong target. It doesn't kill the cell. So that's the kind of question you ask first. And then you can ask if it has an MIC, if it kills the cell, does it do it because it's inhibiting your target? So we explore the mechanism of action, ask for resistance, toxicity, spectrum, cytal static, et cetera. In this case, where we have an idea, we know it gets into the cell, and then we ask about chemistry, we can do secondary assays now to confirm that mode of action. Is it doing what you think it's doing based on the whole cell activity? So we'll talk about that, and then again, resistance, tox, et cetera. And here, this one, where you know that you can kill a bacterium, but you don't really know how, the most important question is toxicity, because really, what you want in the end is something that kills bacteria, but not the host, not the patient. And so tox is really the, the sort of alternative to this, kills the cell, not the, not the host. And, and so that's the most important question up front. When you see papers in the literature of, you know, this is a great compound because it kills, kills methicillin-resistant staph, well, I say, so what? Uh, everything kills methicillin-resistant staph except methicillin. And so, um, basically, tox is the real question. And then you'll ask the other standard questions, and I'll go over some of those. Right, so in vitro measures of tox, uh, very simply, you have look for lytic activity. Uh, does it hit membranes? Does it lyse cells? This is red blood cell lysis, um, lactate dehydrogenase cytolysis assays, or cytotoxicity in human cell lines, which is standardly done. You can use, obviously, use controls. You measure viability. You do it in a variety of ways, redox dyes, live dead dyes. This is one called Presto Blue, and that's just a methodology for testing whether the cells are um, dead after treatment. Oh, I see. Okay, so you get a rough, what I call a therapeutic index. Basically, you look at the killing concentration, the CC50, as a ratio uh, with the MIC. And, and then you can say, well, I would like it to be uh, it takes 100 times more to kill the, the, the mammalian cell than it does to kill the bacterium, so you, look for, you aim for about a 100-fold ratio. But in fact, you often start at much less than that, say on the order of around 10-fold. But obviously, you can try to optimize that later on. But for those things that you find, as, as I said, from the empirical killing, if they just kill the cell and at the same concentration kill the mammalian cell, probably not a good idea to go further. Okay, um, I do note that it's important to look at protein binding, plasma protein binding, PPB, at this point, because that can interfere with your cytotoxicity test. If your compound is very tightly bound, 99.9% .9 bound, there'll be very little free, and even if, and you do your cells, your, your cell tissue, tissue culture in, say, 10 or 20% serum, and so that can tie up all of your compound and make, make it look very safe, whereas you do your MIC in, in standard media without protein, and um, it looks like it's hitting the bacterium. So this is just a, my main caveat when I look at uh, this kind of test. Uh, you basically have to make sure that you're not being fooled by, by serum binding. Okay. So if you look at mechanism of action, again, you ask, is your MIC due to the inhibition of the target? Because everyone, it seems, makes that assumption, and it's not a fair assumption. In my years of doing screening at, at Merck, for example, in certain pathways, we could find inhibitors of a whole bunch of enzymes in a pathway, say the cell wall pathway, and none of them, and some of them were antibacterial, but none of those killed the bacterium because of um, inhibiting those enzymes. They killed them for tox, you know, toxic, they were toxic, they were lytic, they were detergents, they were poisons. So this is really a critical question. The way I like to look at this is first do macromolecular synthesis labeling. Uh, it requires radioactivity. There are other ways now, but they're not as good. Uh, and a lot of people don't like to do radioactivity or they're not licensed for it, so that's, that's a holdup. 
But it does support the idea that you're hitting something specific, you're not hitting everything. I'll show you some curves of that here. So here's uh, vancomycin, and you're measuring DNA, RNA, phospholipid, protein, and cell wall. Nothing is affected except cell wall in this case. And that's what you'd like to see, that you're having a, a very specific effect. And this is a concentration, so it's a dose response and percent of inhibition. Uh, but you might also ask, does overproduction of the target that you are presuming was your, your, your target, does that raise the MIC? Uh, does underexpression of the target lower the MIC? Now, those are interesting. Neither of them are proof, but they are supportive of the idea that you're looking at the right target. But the most important or the most real <laughs> answer is that you get resistant mutations that map in the target gene, and you can show that changes in the target are uh, do both change the activity or the function of, the, of that enzyme and also change the, its sensitivity to the inhibitor. So resistance, that's a question. You select for resistance, you map the mutations. Nowadays, you can get very fast whole genome sequencing, where you can ask for just sequencing of those regions that you think are important. I would do the whole genome. And this is the problem, um, curses. You get resistance. Um, and so that's nice, because it can tell you where the <laughs> what your target is, and it can show that you're probably hitting that specific target. But you're also getting resistance, which means that you might well have resistance in the clinic. So the question is, what's the frequency of resistance? And that's an important question that you ask pretty much up front. Uh, if it's high frequency and the b bugs are fit, uh, then it, it is possible that the, the compound will select rapidly for resistance in the clinic. And actually, if it's high enough, um, it might be present before you even give the drug. So the idea is it's, reflect, it's related to the infectious load of the pathogen. If there's 10 to the 10th bacteria in an infection in the whole body, and your resistance frequency is 10 to the minus eighth, then there'll be 100 bugs that are already resistant within the infection. And so those could grow up. Uh, so, um, so 10 to the minus eighth is probably too high a frequency. But 10 to the minus ninth, well, that's pretty low. And it probably means there's maybe one or two specific sites where you get that resistance. But is that low enough? to be good in the clinic. And in fact, we don't know because we don't have enough models. We don't have enough tests and ways of doing standardized um, testing in vitro, although that's getting better. But in vivo, it's very hard to do those experiments because you really need a very high inoculum, uh, a high number of bugs to work with that sort of reflects what you see in humans. And that's hard to get in an animal model. But that's really what we need to do is, is work out what the effect of resistance rates are and what will work in, in the clinic. So I'll just give a little background. This is a compound called Nargenesin, and it was uh, worked on at Merck where I, after I left, and these are with my um, scientific children and grandchildren who worked on this, um, and found that this Nargenesin was very interestingly an inhibitor of DNA replication. It was found in an in a underexpression screen where you looked for turning off gyre B. Um, and so that was lowered. And it turns out that inhibitors of many steps in DNA replication uh, are enhanced in this background. You get them to, to have a, a lower MIC. So they found this compound. And if you looked at macromolecular synthesis labeling in staph and in a permeable um, uh, efflux minus E. coli, you got quite specific DNA replication inhibition and not other pathways. Uh, you induce SOS, the SOS pathway, which is induced with many of the steps of DNA replication. You can't see this, but there's a nice filament formation also. What you expect is the phenotype of a, of a replication inhibitor. And if they looked at frequency of re resistance, it was low, but real, 10 to the minus ninth. It mapped in DNA E, the regular the polymerase, although it's in gram positives, that's one of two polymerases, the lagging strand polymerase, and in E. coli, it's the major polymerase and it was at a single site. This is the DNA E inhibition. It didn't inhibit polymerases from humans, alpha, beta, gamma. Um, and here's some other replication inhibitors that didn't inhibit it. So that showed that it seemed to be quite specific, uh, killed rapidly, but it has a narrow spectrum. In fact, in the gram positives, it only kills staphs. In the gram negatives, it will work if you can get rid of efflux. And so it's a sort of narrow spectrum. The serum effect is not too bad. It raises the MIC about fourfold, so um, that's probably doable. Uh, and this shows that it's in vivo. It has efficacy in vivo against Staph aureus. Uh, you can get killing. This is in a, um, 
a kidney, the target organ assay for killing, uh, for accumulation of bugs in kidney, and then they're killed off. And so this is by oral or sub-Q. And this is a control of the nasal lid, I guess. <laughs> and that's, that's oral. So you can see that it's, even though it's MIC is 0.25 here, it's quite low, even lower than the linazolid, uh, linazolid is more potent. So it may be that it just has some problems in vivo and that's other things you have to deal with. But it does show that it is active. So this is sort of a case where showing you the kinds of ways you'd look and study uh, the early stages of a compound. So is the HIT worth further work? Does it have reasonable potency, low toxicity, low resistance potential, spectrum? And is it chemically attractive? So uh, if it meets some of those but not all, you might try to improve by medicinal chemistry in an iterative process, evaluate uh, the pharmacology, do in vivo efficacy, and consider now the TPP, the target product profile, which we'll talk about. And then establish an SAR optimized for these functions to see if you can get something that's going to work. Um, and, and John Tomiko will talk about the TPP. So with a more optimized lead, and I'm not going to have time to go into any of these, but just to mention, you have ADME, the pharmacology, look at in vitro measures and in vivo measures of adsorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Some of the in vitro ones are solubility, stability, et cetera, Herg inhibition, a variety of tests that are done standardly. You also look at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics are, the, um, you dose and you see where uh, this is, uh, I guess, sub-Q dosing of gapotidacin, and uh, you can see at different concentrations, you get different peak levels, that's the Cmax, uh, different area under the curve, which is this space, et cetera, and, and the half-life, so you get dose, volume of distribution, AUC, et cetera, that you can measure from this kind of experiment, and then you can look at the pharmacodynamics, which is basically asking what that dosage does, um, and dosage and root does in the body, and then what that does to bacteria, to the uh, infectious load. So this is cefotaxime, where you can see that. You're trying to relate the killing, and this is in a lung assay, um, by cefotaxime to the Cmax, to the AUC, the total dosage, or to the time above MIC. And it turns out that for cefotaxime, as it is with all beta-lactams, you get killing that is related to the time that the drug is above the MIC in the body. And that's sort of nice. But other drugs and other mechanisms have other, other re re results. Um, also, look at animal efficacy. So a survival model, for example, a septicemia model where you look, uh, where you, this is with plecticin, a peptide, which is specific for lipid 2. Uh, without any drug, the cell, everyone dies off, all the mice die off uh, with a vehicle. And if you treat for one day or two days, you get pretty good saving. Uh, there's also a CFU model, as I mentioned with the lung before, where you get the vehicle with no dose and then with drug, and you get um, killing of the, of the bugs. So you can look at both the killing of the bugs and the saving of the animals. In vivo toxicity, where you look at genotox, um, acute tox, and longer term, multiple dosing in, in animals, and this is what you'll need to do eventually before you go to an IND. Okay, so do you have a candidate? Is it safe enough at dose levels? that are high enough to cure the infections? Does it have a useful antibacterial spectrum? Is dosing the dosing root and regimen commensurate with a desired indication? In other words, does it meet the TPP, a target product profile? Is this possibly a, tar a, pro a product? And so that will be talked about. Okay, so now we'll get to the chemistry with Tim. Okay. I'm the chemist. So. A high throughput screen is always a seminal moment in any program. It's a, it's a significant investment. So it's a real expression of commitment. It's the first time from a chemist's point of view that we say we really want to do this. We want to make a drug out of this program. And a lot of times it's the first time the chemist even hears about the program, especially at a big company like Merck. We're brought in at this stage. So a lot of the biology that prefigures this, we don't even know about. But the high throughput screen, and when you get the results back from it, it's often the high watermark of optimism for a program too. Many programs are steadily downhill after that. And when you start to look at the results of a high throughput screen, you have, you have a little sense of that Christmas morning expectation. What's going to be in there? Is it going to be something really good? Now at Christmas morning, you open all your presents, and you pretty much know if you got what you want. You know, socks again, another tie. 
But the thing about a high throughput screen is it isn't always that clear. So sometimes you open all the packages and you're still not sure what you got. And so let's talk about that a little bit because it's really important because making good decisions here can have tremendous effects on every subsequent part of the program. So the first thing I'd ask you if I was your consultant is, well, what did you screen? And if it turns out that you screen small molecules, and we'll talk about natural products in a moment, then the next question that I would ask is, what, what was your screening cell? What was the collection that you screened? I come from Big Pharma. I spent 26 years at Merck, and a Big Pharma sample collection is probably the best answer that you can give. The, the collections have specific deficits for antibacterials that we'll address later. But in general, they're very large. Pharmaceutical companies have worked in a lot of different areas, so they're populated with lots of different structure types. And my experience is that if you are screening against a target that has a pocket, you'll probably find at least one useful tractable hit from a big pharma sample collection. So they're really big. You'll usually find something, and you'll usually find something with a hit that has maybe low micromolar activities, which is perfect to start lead ID and lead optimization program. Now, if you don't work at Big Pharma, having access to this kind of library is very difficult. A lot of Big Pharma companies are starting up incubators, and so one of the thoughts is, one of the ways they can make this more attractive would be to make their libraries available for screening. So that, I just want to get that idea out there, because right now, the sample collection of Big Pharma is thought of as a crown jewels. And they're very protective of it. But we really, it would, it would be good for the industry as a whole if more of us had access to this kind of thing. I'm out at Merck now, so I no longer have access to Merck's sample collection. I work for a small company called Prokaryotics that I hope you'll be hearing more about in the future. But if we could screen the big sample collections, that would be great. A lot of times we can't. Fortunately, there are a lot of libraries for hire now. There are more and more of them. Now, I personally don't have a lot of experience with this, but I've talked to a lot of people that have used them. There are a lot of possibilities. Generally, the libraries are smaller than what you get at Big Pharma, but sometimes they're tailored in a certain direction, to a, to a certain target type, to a certain set of chemical properties. And so that can be useful, even though the libraries are smaller. Also, very often, the constitution of the library is better, and we're going to talk about that in just a second in terms of purity and, and a proper identification of samples. Generally, you know, though, the, the experience that friends of mine have that have used them is that the results are really a mixed bag. Some people have gotten very good results with this, others not so much. And there does seem to be a general tendency toward them trying to do things as quickly as possible. It's not your baby. And when it's not your baby, a lot of times the quality of the daycare isn't as good, as I'm sure we're all aware of. So if, you, you know, if this is the only option, then you go with it and you hope for the best. All right. There's some general caveats for screening, some things that you always have to worry about. The most important, I think, is to realize that number of compounds is often a very poor index of chemical diversity. And this happened with combinatorial chemistry. You can make a two million member combinatorial library that really hits only the smallest speck of structure space. And on the other hand, you can have a library of 100,000 compounds that is actually well spread out. Now, in general, a library with more compounds in it is going to be better, but this is not always true, and it's worth some consideration. And there's something wrong with every library that you're ever going to come across, including the big pharma ones. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Any library that you ever screen, almost all of the samples are not going to be present at the nominal concentration. And most of the time, they're not going to be pure. And this is probably actually more true for big pharma libraries because many of those samples were deposited 20 years ago, and they've been sitting in DMSO at room temperature ever since. And so they may not be there at all, Some, and they're certainly not pure. Some of them certainly will be misidentified or completely decomposed. So if you get a great hit, you don't really know for sure if what the structure that is drawn is really what it represents. And so we'll talk about that. And that is going to be true no matter how you screen, and you have to keep it in mind. So what this all means is that the data from an HTS screen is at best a pretty fuzzy picture. I'm pretty nearsighted, so if I take my glasses off and look at the crowd, that's what I'm looking at. Put them back on, I see something a lot more clear, but it takes a long time to go from the fuzzy to the clear picture, and we'll talk about ways to do it. 
two things that are almost always true is that false positives will be the bulk of your hits. So you're going to get a lot of hits. It's always a happy Christmas morning after a high throughput screen. But a lot of the presents are going to turn out not to be what you thought they were. And the real positives are not going to be order, you know, so the, mo the best hit you get is probably not going to be your most active compound. They're not going to be ordered by potency or anything else. So making sense out of this the right way is critically important. All right, what do you do? All right, so first thing you want to do is you're going to have, you're going to have screened, you know, 100,000 to 2 million compounds. Can't work on them all. The number of hits you get is going to be too large to work on, so you have to do some kind of triage. You have to cut this huge hit list down to something reasonable. And so that really means that you have to guess which are the good ones. Now, medicinal chemistry is an art. It's also a science, but it's, a lot of it is art. And so this is where a good medicinal chemist can really earn their money. Okay? There are computational methods that someone not trained in chemistry can use, and we'll talk about some of those later to eliminate Payne's compounds, but you really need a chemist here, a medicinal chemist. And if you don't have one, you ought to hire a consultant, because this is where you need one. And, and you know, I should just say right here, and we can talk about, we can, we can explore this idea more later in the questions and answers, but every medicinal chemist is an organic chemist, but the converse is not true. And so if you have an organic chemist handy and they're not a medicinal chemist, they may not be who you need. Okay, just keep that in mind. Um, you want to look at as many hits as you can. It's an investment of resources, and so there's going to be some limit to it. But the more that you can look at now, the more possibilities that you will have moving forward. So this is a, usually a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Think of it that way. Cast your net as wide as possible. And then there's two very important things you have to do. So normally you will screen at one concentration. So the hits that you pick, the compounds that you think are good, first thing you do is take the same sample and titrate it. And if, if the titration doesn't make any sense, then throw it out. But if it looks like it titrates, so far so good. But you still don't know that what they say is in that sample is what is actually responsible for the activity that you're seeing could be a minor impurity, or the sample could simply be mislabeled. It could be all one thing, but something else. So that's where you want to get a chemist to resynthesize as many of the good hits as possible. And again, this is a commitment of resources, but a valuable one. Remake it. You know what it is. Test it in a titration assay. And if that looks good, you probably have a bona fide hit on your hands. The ultimate validation is tractability and lead op. That is when medicinal chemists start to work on this for real, that they can improve it, that they can improve the potency and improve the properties. And we're going to talk about that specifically coming right up here. So here's what you don't want to do. So I was just talking to a guy who uh, worked in Big Pharma for a long time, and uh, then he worked at Rutgers, helping, helping scientists at Rutgers commercialize their invention. So the first thing they do is they get a three micromolar hit and they write a patent and the next thing they do is call them on the phone and they say, you know, I'd like to make a deal. He goes, well, how much money do you think you want? They go, well, you know, I don't know. I was thinking maybe $10 million. And so don't write a patent on your three micromolar hit and you're not going to get $10 million. There's a lot of work in between that three micromolar hit and your $10 million. I hope you get it. You may very well, but you're not going to get it directly from the three micromolar hit. And if you, if you write a patent on compounds that are unoptimized, 18 months later, it's going to publish. Everybody's going to know what you're up to, and you might not have made any progress at all. So it's not the time. And we can talk about IP if that comes up as a question, IP strategies. OK, a lot of people here have probably heard about PANES. It's a cool acronym, right? It means Pan Assay Interference Compounds. Uh, some guys in science or nature, nature magazine got Roz Chast, you know, the New Yorker cartoonist, to draw a cartoon for it. It's cute. It's a cute idea. Uh, it's Jonathan Bale is a guy who has written many, many papers about this. And so what this means is compounds that show up in a lot of assays all the time. So regardless of what you screen, these guys raise their hand. It's like, here, here I am, you know, pick me. And so you want to throw these out, right? Here's an example of some of the most common structures. This isn't really a chemistry talk, so I'm not going to go into any details about it, but let's just hit the high points here. So pan interference compounds turn up and it hits in a lot of assays. But here's an important thing to know. Pains are not all the same because they, they end up as pains for different reasons. Some of them interfere with the assay readout. Fluorescent compounds can do this. So if you have a fluorescent assay, your fluorescent compound may just simply you know, show up as a hit when it isn't really doing anything in the assay. Aggregation is another very common mechanism. So they sort of make like molecular saran wrap and cover up 
the cavity on the, on the enzyme, and it looks like it's inhibiting, but it's not. They can covalently bond, they can redox cycle, but, and this is kind of interesting. So there, there is a subset of compounds that are actually true promiscuous hits. They're binding to, your, to the, you know, the cavity on your target, but they bind to a lot of targets, and there's a word for this now. It's called bright chemical matter, because there's another set of compounds called dark chemical matter that seem never to bind to anything. So bright chemical matter, a lot of people, you know, we, in pharma, we've gotten way, way away from pleiotropy. Everything is sniper now. You've got to hit your target and nothing else. But a lot of old drugs actually hit a lot of targets. It's called pleiotropy, right? And so the idea that you could take something that is bright ch chemical matter and turn it into a drug is an interesting idea. So if it turns out that your pain is in the last category, bright chemical matter, maybe if you have the patience, you might want to consider it. That's a decision that, that only you can make in the privacy of your, of your work up of, of your high throughput screen. A couple of popular compounds, and so there's a thing out there called pains shaming, so watch for that. That's where you write the patent, you write a paper, and you go, I did a screen, and I found these great hits, and your hits are rhodonines and curcumin, and then everybody laughs. You know, they're going to write you up in the blog, going to be in the pipeline, everybody's going to say, this, you know, this guy, look what he did, he had all rhodonines and curcumin in his, in his uh, hit assay, so don't, whatever you do, don't write a paper saying that you found these as hits. Okay, having said that, it isn't impossible that it is actually like a proper hit. And Lynn has a story about this. She can tell if she wants to, about road means, right? And, uh, and so it, these show up a lot, but there is a thought that maybe they might actually be, or at least some of them, bright chemical matter. And in that sense, maybe they're worth consideration. But if you're not sure, just stay away. So, when pains first came out, Jonathan Bell and company decided that what we should do is simply come up with a computational filter that would allow untrained scientists, not chemists, but allied scientists, to run a filter and throw all the pains out. Sounds like a great idea. All of that kind of thing is harder to do than it sounds. It reminds me of being at Home Depot and seeing this guy like me who's in, bought this giant saw to do some kind of plumbing in his garage. It's like, if you know how to use that thing, awesome. If you don't, I don't know. Right? You could do a lot more damage with it than good. And computational filters are sort of the same way. You really need a chemist running this. And so there's a lot of filters out there, but not all of them really will throw out the pains. And predictably, there's been a backlash. So the backlash now, there's a very recent paper saying that you know, night, we found the majority of all the compounds containing pains alerts were actually infrequent hitters in alpha screen, and so it's throwing out a lot of useful compounds. So what I would say about this is that a computational filter used by a trained medicinal chemist is an enormous help, but if you don't know anything about medicinal chemistry, maybe the computational filter is not enough. So we said before that tractability and lead op is the ultimate validation. So let's talk about what that means. When we come up with a tractable lead from our, our high throughput screen, we say that it has a coherent SAR. That means structure activity relationship. I'm sure everybody knows that. Now, some structures are easier to make analogs of than others, but if you have a good team of medicinal chemists on your program, there is no hit that you get that they can't develop an SAR from, and they won't even tell you that, so, so don't worry about it. it. It can be done. We can, make, we can make analogs. So tractable leads, having a coherent SAR means they can be optimized, and that's, that's called lead opt, right? The opt of lead opt is optimization, and that's what a team of medicinal chemists will do. If what you discovered is a pain, unless it's bright chemical matter, it will not be able to be optimized. If it's fluorescing, if it is aggregating, you will not be able to get a coherent SAR, and you can't go anywhere with it. So you will have wasted a little time. But like I said before, cast a wide net. You'll know now if you're working on something that can't be optimized, and you'll stop. But you won't have missed something. All right. This is really important, and, and for people that don't have a lot of experience in MedChem, it's sometimes astonishing how quickly potency can be increased. So the first thing your medicinal chemist can do, probably, is make much more potent compounds. It's not at all unusual to have a two micromolar high throughput screen hit go down to 50 nanomolar in just a couple of rounds of synthesis. That's pretty easy to do and it's expected. The main reason for it is that a lot of binding is simply lipophilic. It's uh, the hydrophobic effect, so you're kicking water out of the active site. So if you raise the lipophilicity of your compounds and you don't do anything else obviously wrong, then you're going to increase the potency. 
That's not always good. What you're really trying to do is lower dose, and so it turns out to be a lot more complicated than just raising potency because the cost in lipophilicity can interfere with the PK, off-target and tox issues, but what it does tell you is that you have a tractable lead. It's not always the answer, but if you're able to increase potency in, in an SAR-guided manner, you have a tractable lead and you can hopefully work all of the other issues out afterward. So lead optimization is actually fundamentally, I think, mostly an exercise in property management. And we're going to talk about properties next, right? So properties are really important. They're, they're harder to get your mind around than potency. Potency is very easy. Everybody responds to potency. Properties are a lot more diffuse, but they're very important because what we're trying to do is, is lower dose. And so that responds to both potency and properties. Both are really important. Please use microphone. Oh, sorry. Can you, hear, can you hear me now? So, I hear a little echo when I use the mic, and so maybe I was like going away from it on purpose. Uh, we want to develop our leads in a way so that potency is increased, but properties are maintained. And for antibacterials, that's especially difficult, especially for gram negatives, and we're going to talk about that, that in just a moment, what it means to have good properties in the area of antibacterials. I think probably lots of you have heard of Chris Lipinski. He's a famous guy. He's probably the most famous medicinal chemist there is. And he came up with something called the rule of five. The rule of five is a way to predict good properties for oral bioavailability, okay? What, what you want is to have a molecular weight of less than 500. So that's sort of average drug size and down. That is not too large. Log P is a measure of lipophilicity. So it's how much it partitions into octanol instead of water. And then a limit on the amount of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, because we're looking for compounds here that will cross a membrane. And so if you have lots of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, they're making contacts to water, and all of you have to pay an energetic price to break those before it can go into the membrane. So Lipinski did this basically just to try to find an area of structure space that would afford lots of orally bioavailable drugs, okay? And so it's called drug-like. And so when you're talking to a medicinal chemist and you say, we found some leads and they look drug-like, what you mean is that they're within Lipinski space. So there's been a lot of work on this in the 20, 30 years since he came up with the first paper. And so one of the things that was recognized, like I said before, is that when you do lead opt to increase potency, you, you bulk everything up. Everything gets fatter. You add, you add bits to the molecule here and there to fill out the active site. And so in general, your molecular weight is going to go up and your log P is going to go up. So this guy, Aprea, wrote a paper saying that for a lead, for a hit, from a high throughput screen, if you can start lower, that's good. So instead of 500 and log P less than 5, if you start at molecular weight 300 and log P less than 3, that gives you some room in lead op to improve your potency and get your binding right, and you're still in the Lipinski space. And so, if you, so that's good to keep in mind when you're picking your hits. If all of your hits are already large, you're not going to have as much room to do what you need to do with them. So you might want to favor the ones that are a little bit smaller. And the ultimate way to do this is fragment screening, which I think Tom is going to talk about a little bit. And so that's a very interesting way to go. A lot smaller, some different rules, and we can take questions about that if you, if you have more of them. Uh, this is just an old Merck program that I worked on. It wasn't in the area of antibacterials, but you can see that in general. This was a tractable hit. Things get larger, larger, and more complicated as they get to PCC, and all of the all of the properties go from you know all over the place to uniformly excellent. So that's the kind of trajectory that we're looking for from a hit all the way to a preclinical candidate. Just an example. Now. Uh, the other thing you can screen, of course, is not small molecules at all, but natural products. And there's an unlimited amount of stuff to say about this. And I've only got about, you know, like I'm going I'm to give myself 30 seconds. So, so just, just to hit the high points, if you screen natural products, for a long time there, what you probably did was find everything that's already been found before. And so I was at Merck when that was going on. And in fact, a lot of companies, a lot of big pharma, lost patience with their natural products groups. And many of them dissolved their natural products groups because they just thought they kept finding the same things. Now, in the meantime, so I was out of antibacterials for a while, came back. And I've learned that a lot has been done in the meantime. So there are fancy ways to screen. And companies like Warp Drive and Lodo are doing things with like looking at the, um, you know, the genome to find Speed, you know, to find actinomycetes that would produce bacteria, but it's hard to isolate them. And so there's a lot of, I think, there's a resurgence of interest in natural products. 
But in the old days, you might not have found anything else. Nowadays, you're liable to. So if you did, what if you found an interesting new natural product? Two important questions. One is, is it good enough to be a development candidate on its own? Now, this is a question you would never ask about a small molecule. The answer will always be no. But for a natural product, the answer might be yes. For lots of reasons, right? Because these were, these were actually optimized. I mean, millions of, uh, lots of evolution has, all, in many cases, nearly perfected this compound. So maybe you're ready to go. And if not, there is a thing called semi-synthesis, and you know that's been done with beta-lactams and tons of things. So you, you take the compound, and then you do a little bit of chemistry with it, and now you, know, you may have something that's very interesting. To do that, in order to do that, you need to be able to ferment it on a large enough scale in order to actually do some chemistry. So that's the next question. Can you make enough of it to hand it over to your team of med chemists and have them make some derivatives? And so if you can, you know, that's a, a very attractive route. All right, so let's talk a little bit, let's generalize the idea of drug-like. Lipinski defined drug-like. He was trying to make oral drugs. He wanted to come up with a compound. You take it by mouth, it's actually going to give you systemic exposure. And with a cardiovascular program, if you have potency and you're drug-like, you're on the right path. Go. But for antibacterials, it can be more complicated than that because not only do you have to get exposure in the mammalian tissue of interest, you have to penetrate the organism. And so that's an added barrier that a cardiovascular program normally doesn't face. So you don't have to worry about just drug-like. You have to also worry about antibacterial-like. So let's think about what Lipinski was trying to do. So he's, he's trying to come up with a property space that will be populated by compounds that will cross the gut. Now, so if you've got to do that, you know, the, the gut membrane and the gram-positive membrane are grossly similar. They're not exactly the same. Lincoln talk in detail about this, but they're, they're somewhat similar, and the peptidoglycan is usually easy to weave your way through. So drug, if you, if you have good oral bioavailability, you can often penetrate gram-positive organisms. And so drug-like, by Lipinski standards, is often approximately gram-positive antibacterial-like. And so that's why there has been more success target screening to make, you know, oxazolidinones, all that, all the gram-positive agents that were discovered. It's a lower barrier. Now, here's the thing. And linazolid, for example, is firmly in Lipinski space. You look at the properties here, this could be a cardiovascular drug. Nothing fancy, nothing special. But drug-like, by Lipinski standards, is almost never gram-negative antibacterial-like. That's a whole different ballgame. And in fact, what gram-negative antibacterial-like even means, sorry, we don't really understand. And, and if you've read Lynn's papers, that's, it's well explicated by, by review, the Lynn's latest review. It's a, it's, it's a mystery in a way. It's a, what, what we even mean by that, because if we look at Lipinski space, actually, let me go to this, let me go to, oh, okay, forget it. I got a, got a later slide that bears on this. So everybody, I think, is familiar with the challenges. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but it's orthogonal set of membranes. Actually, the outer membrane will generally exclude anything that can't get through the porin, and so you want things that are small and very water-soluble and not very lipophilic, and then, the cytoplasmic mem membrane is a membrane pretty much like the gut and all that. So everything that just got in through the porin can't make it through the cytoplasmic membrane. And even if it could, it's liable to get pumped out anyway because they have very effective pumps that pump out from the cytoplasm and the periplasm. So it's an enormous, currently unsolved challenge to come up with a good set of general rules about how to penetrate and stay in gram-negative organisms. So the result is that if you do a screen, you can find tractable drug-like hits that will kill E. coli that has impaired LPS synthesis and knocked out pump. So usually you, you bring down LPXC and you knock out TOL-C, and then your compound can get in, and it will work on its target. But they can never, in general, be optimized to kill wild-type bacteria. So if you have those pumps and your LPS intact, they will just never get in. So when you do target screening, on targets for gram-negative bacteria, you'll find things that will hit your target, but you will find it's almost impossible to engineer the molecule so that it can get to your target. Drug-like, we understand. Gram-positive antibacterial-like, we understand. Gram-negative bacterial-like, we fundamentally do not understand. But it exists. There is such a thing, and there, there are small molecules that do work by getting into and staying in gram-negative antibacterials. And here are some of them. The problem is 
that we just haven't been able to look at these. Well, like Lipinski looked at the set of all early bioavailable drugs and drew some general rules that proved useful. What we haven't been able to do is look at the much, and I emphasize this, much smaller set of small molecules that get into gram-negative bacteria and learn anything really useful at all that is predictive. Right, it's been very hard to do. And if you look at the property space, this is just molecular weight and C log D, you can see that they kind of, you know, if you're looking at gram positive versus gram negative and all that, they occupy different bits of space. But this is not the answer because you can make compounds that fall in the right space that don't work, and you can make compounds that fall outside of that space that do. So this doesn't give you the answer. This is interesting, but it is not the answer. So then, you know, there have been a lot of attempts to come up with the answer, and a recent one is Hergen Rother's paper. I'm sure a lot, of you, uh, a lot of the people in the audience know about this, and I'm, I'm gonna end with this. And there's, there's a lot of, of questions about what's going on here. It isn't really clear exactly what was done at every point. He basically tries to come up with a set of rules, though, for getting into and staying in gram-negative bacteria. And, and I admire his brio. I think that it's, bo it's a bold move. He's given a prescription that can be tested. We'll find out pretty quickly how generally well it works. And the things that he is emphasizing is not the normal set of Lipinski parameters, where it's just you know, log D, log P, hydrogen bonds, rotatable bonds. The things that he seized upon are, are, first of all, specifying a particular functional group. He says you'll be ahead of the game if you have a primary amine. Lipinski never said anything like that, right? A high lipophilic moment. The idea of moment is new. So moment basically means where you position the lipophilic bit versus the, the hydrophilic part. A high moment means they're not on top of each other, but they're, they're uh, staged away from each other. It's on the edge. Uh, that it needs to be rigid and not very globular. So something like adamantane is globular. It's like a ball, but benzene is not. So this is very interesting to me. And you know, I think that this is, not, this is also not the answer. But it might be part of an answer, and I think it's an approach that is very interesting. I think that we need to broaden our perspective beyond the normal Lipinski properties in order to try to solve this problem. So I'm going to leave it with that. I think that there are big scientific challenges ahead. We're starting to make progress on this, and I think that it's a very exciting time to be a medicinal chemist in the area of anti -infectives. What I'm going to try to do here is run through a, an example, one example, of exactly how you move something from hit to lead and ultimately into the clinic. I usually do this at a course that uh, Dr. Patrice Covalone and several others put together. It was mentioned earlier. If you want to know more about the course, ask Patrice. I usually do this in two one-hour sessions, so this is going to be the extreme cliff notes version of this. So drug R&D itself. We're going to talk about the process of finding a new compound and developing it. And what we'll see is there's very, there are various ways you can find new compounds. Um, also, how you progress a drug to a lead compound. And the most important thing there is it takes a team of individuals that have very different skills. You need chemistry, pharmacology, microbiology, uh, a broad range of skills. Um, later on, I'll also talk a little bit about pharmacokinetics and some of the toxicology models that are important, and how you prepare a compound for an IND, the various stages you have to go through to get a compound uh, to the point where the FDA will allow you to take it into the clinic. So developing a hit to the lead, the two key areas really that you have to pay attention to are efficacy and safety. Um, and as you go along, what you're going to do is start with some relatively simple assays, but then as you, as you get further on and you start to develop your lead, you're going to have to do additional testing. But in the, in the beginning, we really just look for MIC in whole cells, reasonable PK in animal infection models, and we do a number of in vitro tests for toxicology. So rather than discussing sort of the generalities of this, what I'm gonna do is give you a real life example of something we did at AstraZeneca. But before I do this, I'm gonna go through a few uh, points here that are important. So there are several parameters for hit to lead optimization. Obviously the improvement of activity, so you're looking at target engagement, things of that nature. You're also going to be looking at mitigation of resistance development. So you're going to be putting organisms in there that have known resistance mechanisms and seeing what their impact is on your compound as you go forward. You want to minimize serum binding. Lynn touched on this, but what you have to understand that it is the protein bound fraction of an antimicrobial is microbiologically inactive. So it's the free fraction you really have to pay a lot of attention to. 
Um, and that's why, as was mentioned in the previous talk, when you start uh, putting a lot of lipophilicity, you tend to increase protein binding, so your free fraction goes down quite a bit. And uh, so finally, you have to optimize both PK and PD properties of your test compound. Um, this is a quick pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. And the important thing here is different antibiotic classes are effective due to what we call different PK drivers, that is PK, PD parameters. And Lynn touched on this. Um, for example, aminoglycosides tend to be concentration dependent. As you go above the MIC of your, of your uh, strains, what happens is the higher you go, the more killing you get. In the case of other compounds, it's AUC over MIC, so it's this total area here. And in the case of beta-lactams, it's time above the MIC. And there, what happens is as you go above the MIC, you don't see any additional killing. So it's the total time you're above the MIC that's really important when you're talking about beta-lactams. Again, these are kind of generalities, but in, in general, they do hold up for this, these classes of compounds. And one of the things you're going to have to do with your new compound is determine which of these drivers is important for your novel compound. The other thing that's going to be very important is what's called the TI, the therapeutic index. And this is the ratio of the maximum tolerated dose, maximum toxic dose, over the MIC. And what you're trying to do is get your maximum therapeutic range here. MIC 90, which we'll talk about later, these are contemporary strains. And what that means is this is the level of drug you need to address 90% or more of the contemporary strains that are out there with the resistance mechanisms. What you're trying to do is maximize this therapeutic range. Um, you're always going to go above the MIC. You just don't want to go up into the MTC, maximum tolerated concentration uh, range, when you're doing something of this nature. So that's part of the optimization process we'll talk about. Now, programs can start from a number of different ways. One way that is quite popular is take existing compounds and modify them to circumvent resistance, reduce toxicity, improve the PK. Or you can do a novel class, which is identified by high-throughput screening, which you just heard about. And the example I'm going to use is structure-based drug design and fragments. Um, in case of a novel compound, the initial hits, you retest, and you do IC50s in an enzyme assay. And then you're also interested in the specificity. Lynn touched this. You want to do initially some tests in some fairly crude ways, namely look at yeast and mammalian cells, make sure that they're not toxic to that. You also want to see the spectrum. Do I'm, am I getting mostly gram positives? Am I getting gram negatives? Am I getting atypicals? Uh, as we go along, medicinal chemistry, DMPK, and toxicology become very critical. And we'll talk a bit about some of the ways you have to pay attention to toxic liabilities. The most important thing is, the most potent compound is not necessarily the best starting point. People get enamored of MICs and they'll go, oh, that's the most potent, we'll start with that. As you'll see, it's very important to investigate a couple of chemical series and not be seduced by uh, high activity at the beginning. So this is sort of the process you, you follow. You have chemical design and the limitations around that. You use structural data, if you have it, on target compound interaction. You look at target engagement and inhibition if you have an enzyme assay, change the log D, add interactive groups, and I'll show you examples of this to modify efficacy, cell penetration, solubility, PK, all those various properties. Usually we start off with a small MIC testing panel, which we expand later on. Preclinical toxicology testing, you've probably all heard about in vitro HERG, which is a very important cardiac channel that you have to keep an eye on, mammalian cell tox. Then you take all these results, you usually have team meetings, meetings of discussion, and you go around and do the cycle all over again with another uh, set of compounds based on the results you get here. And over time, you evolve the compounds, or at least over time, you hope you evolve the compounds that meet the criteria as, quick, as closely as possible, um, have a broader MIC, and you'll include MDR strains. You'll do an animal infection model with satellite PK to get a preliminary half-life volume distribution, other um, type of parameters are important, and a CERB panel, which is a, a generalized uh, panel that allows you to look at interactions of your compound with a number of receptors, and this is usually done by an outside organization. So what I'm going to be talking about here in, in uh, specific terms is a novel DNA, DNA gyrase inhibitor that we had going at AstraZeneca uh, under the leadership of Trevor Trust, who's sitting right down here in the front row. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is an established target, gyrase B subunit, and how we went about finding a novel compound to that. And for this, we used NMR fragment-based screening, in which you use very small fragments, 
You have a diverse library which has uh, relatively small, it's 1,000, 1,500 fragments of low molecular weight. And basically, you're looking at these compounds actually sitting in the active site by NMR. So we did have structural data for this. And what you get is compounds uh, with greater specificity and ligand binding efficiency for the target. So that's what you're looking for. You start off with something weak, and you try to build onto it. And I'll show you that. So here's the initial compound right here, and it's binding with aspartate 81 and also making an interaction with a, a water. So you've got an empty pocket over here with a couple of uh, good-looking uh, good looking amino acids to interact with. So a second screen was done with this molecule in the place, in its place right there. And the second site binder was identified that appeared by NMR to be binding in a more distal region of the pocket, namely this region down here, RJ84 and uh, there. So a number of what we call right side groups, that is the groups over here were tested. And this particular one came out of it as the lead compound we wanted to go forward with. Now, if you look at this, this is number four's properties down here. You go, oh, wait a minute, guys. This isn't as potent as number three. Um, why are you going with number four? Well, this is what I talked about a little bit earlier. Physical properties are very, very important. So you want to have antimicrobial potency, but you want to have reasonable physical properties that you feel the chemist can go forward with. So things like solubility, which is very, very important, and pyrolamide 4 was selected because of these properties as well as antimicrobial properties. What you're betting on is that you can always increase the potency, but the physical properties, if you lock them in too early, you're going to run into problems. You want to have a reasonably low resistance rate, and with this one we did a quick test, and with Staph aureus, it was around 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9th, so that's not a bad starting point at all. One of the things I often see people talk about, though, is, oh, I had a low resistance rate. And the other parameter that no one ever talks about, and it's important, is what is the size of the increase when you do get a mutant? And in this case, what we saw is a four to eight-fold increase in the MIC of the perolamide. Now, I've seen programs where people have had really potent compounds, but as soon as they get a mutant, it goes from 0.5 to greater than 128 in one step. That's not what you want. You want something like this, which is engaging both gyrase and topoisomerase 4. So you want to find a compound that when you do get a resistance mutant, and you will get a resistance mutant, that it's going to stay within a range that if you make a potent enough compound, you still have the possibility of capturing the initial couple of mutants that you will see derived from it. And in vivo activity, in this case, we used an immunocompetent mouse lung infection model and found that, yes, compound 4, although we had to add a lot of it, was able to pass that test. In other words, it did have in vivo activity. So the pilot studies that we did established the series as having potential for a clinical candidate. So the next thing to do is further medicinal chemistry where you're improving your potency and refining the other properties. So while you're doing that, you're going to monitor the bacterial target enzyme inhibition and MIC progression. This is what Lynn was referring to. You want to make sure you're staying on target. Serum protein binding, which is very, very important. As I mentioned before, only the free fraction is active in vivo. Solubility, if your compound isn't soluble, you're not going to be able to get it into patients. Uh, you've got to have something that has reasonable solubility. Log D, which is a measure of lipophilicity, and toxicology assays. Initially, these are mostly in vivo or panel type assays, but later on you're going to be moving to uh, some more serious assays. So this is, as I said, this is the Cliff Notes version. There's actually eight slides. I've cut them down to three. But basically what we're showing here is how we go about optimizing it. In this case, the laser is dying. But in this case, over where the red arrow is, that's where we're making, we're adding these groups that are here. And we're looking at protein binding. We're looking at the gyrase and topoisomerase activity. MICs, and in this case, we're introducing rat clearance. So in other words, we want to see how quickly is the compound cleared in vivo in the rats. The other thing you'll notice is here we're measuring MIC over the fraction unbound. That's very important because, again, it's the unbound fraction that really counts when you get into patients. So we had optimized around a particular group. And then we had done more work at this position, R here, again, using the same set of parameters here. Number 63 was selected. Now, later on, I think you're going to have these slides available to you. You're going to look at these and go, wait a minute, some of those things are better looking compounds. You're going to look at some of these compounds and say, wait a minute, there's other ones that are available that have better parameters. But it's the overall picture of an individual molecule that you're really honing in on and really paying attention to. So if you go through these later on, for example, 
This one is one of the more soluble compounds. Solubility is important. Uh, has a low rat clearance, decent MICs, decent interaction with the target. So these are the kind of parameters you do have to pay atten attention to. And finally, we got to the point where we had about five candidates, four or five candidates that we're going to test uh, across the board. And here we're doing much more um, elaborate kind of things. We're looking not only at mouse and rat clearance, we're also looking at dog clearance. And number 63, again, is the one we selected. It had very low clearance in the dog, rat, and mouse. Um, PKA was good. The solubility was good. So these are the kind of things that you're honing in and finding your final candidate. While you're doing this, and you'll hear this in, after the coffee break, be sure to engage your CMC guys because they're going to have to make a lot of this compound in a very pure fashion in order to go forward with it in testing, not only in your final toxicology test, but that same material has to be the material that initially goes into man. So at this point, you should have your CMC guys already engaged. So this was the compound we decided to go ahead with right here because of these various parameters. And we did a neutropenic thigh model, a mouse model infection with Staph aureus. And the PK data collected was also done not only with efficacy, but we also looked at exposure. Exposure is the amount of compound that the infection actually sees. Now, don't really um, confuse dose with exposure. Dose is the amount you give. The exposure is the resulting amount that actually gets to the target site. So a lot of times you'll increase dose and you'll see funny things happen to the PK. For example, with macrolides, those tend to be um, metabolized by some liver enzymes. You hit a certain point, though, where you've saturated the liver enzymes and you see super proportional amounts of compounds. So dose does not necessarily correlate with the exposure. For compound 63, for the pharmacokinetic properties and bioavailability were favorable across species. Uh, what we saw was the, uh, when we did the mouse model, we saw that we had a change in CFUs per mil in gram positives. By the way, this is a gram positive. It's really for um, community acquired infection. So it has gram positive activity and a little bit of gram negative activity in H, H influenza, Moraxella, those, those uh, particular organisms. So in a neutropenic thigh, we saw good activity with compound 63. We did MIC-90s, which is where you take a number of contemporary clinical strains, usually 100 or 200, and you're looking at the MIC. And we included ones that, now remember, this is a gyrase inhibitor, but it's a gyrase B inhibitor. We included ones that where we saw significant resistance against levo, levofloxacin, and azithromycin. So this compound did extremely well against the organisms that we were looking at. And again, this is an MIC-90. These are usually recent clinical isolates. There are organizations that do these and collect them. But the FDA wants to see this data uh, in the IND itself. So our final things. Compound 63 had a low rate of spontaneous resistance. That's good. And four to eight times, we saw very, very little. Compound 63 showed no signs of mutagenicity. You have to do a number of tests, AIMS mutagenicity in vitro micronucleus a uh, number of different tests, and we had a, th a thousand-fold window uh, between inhibition of the bacterial enzyme and inhibition of human topoisomerase. We saw no HERG inhibition or inhibition of other ion channels. Everybody focuses on HERG, but there are other ion channels in the heart and other places that you have to pay attention to. And it showed no inhibition at the highest concentration across a series of the cytochrome P450 enzymes, which is good because that means you're lessening the, the ability of this to have drug-drug interactions. So it looked like a pretty safe compound to go forward with. So 63 went through and passed pivotal animal tox. And again, this is with CMC material. We established the no adverse effect levels, the maximum tolerated dose. And we put it in IND, filed with the FDA for phase one clinical studies. It was designated as AZD5099. Um, there are a number of papers I put in the package you have, which are references to this if you want to look in more details. Went into human volunteers, phase one SAD, single ascending dose, and multiple ascending doses. It was dosed IV up to 500 mg per uh, individual, but further clinical work was discontinued for a combination of factors. We saw a very high variability in exposure, in other words, X dose gave us a very high variability in terms of exposure, and you're always worried about high variability in exposure because that can cause a lot of issues with either not treating, not getting enough material in there to treat, or some potential tox issues. And there were some concerns related to some uh, mitochondrial changes that were seen in preclinical safety species. 
So after four plus years, the project was discontinued, which is very depressing to the people involved. And I guess my final point to you is if you don't have a high tolerance for failure, don't go into this field. <laughs> also, if you do go in this field and your program fails, it helps to have a high tolerance for alcohol because usually you go out afterwards. So in summary, I briefly described some of the important PKPD principles in optimizing a compound for progression into development, and these are all listed here. This is an example of employing fragment-based drug design, which is a little bit different than the kind of screening you hear about in either natural products or chemical libraries. Um, how you optimize the various parameters to try to balance the properties. You're trying to balance, sort of triangulate into the best set of properties you can get, and MIC is only one of many. Um, despite everything you do, failure is not unusual, and arriving at a single molecule that meets all the criteria is frankly a rare event. Um, and also, this showed that it was possible to approach establishing antibiotic targets with fundamentally new molecules, um, and there's a lot of people out there working on that. With that, I'll end it. Thanks very much. Well, I got this gig by saying I like to aim before I shoot. This isn't a topic I have spoken on before. Um, <clears throat> but um, here's my disclosures. And I'm going to talk about target product profiles and why I think we need them. And if you want the top level uh, abstract summary of my talk, and I'm sure all summer long many of you have been hearing, are we there yet? But I wish I knew where there was, is where Mr. Magoo's running aimlessly. So what is the target product profile? Is it a where, a how, a what, or a why? Uh, I would argue it's a little bit of all of those, probably not a how, but probably the others. How did I prepare for this talk? Well, I, I Googled target product profile. That's one of the ways. And you know, there were a lot of hits, pages and pages of them. 95% of them, surprisingly, were in the pharmaceutical domain, biotech, pharmaceuticals, and the rest were probably in healthcare. I thought we might have something on a video game or maybe an electronic device or a new hoverboard, but nothing. I did come across this paper by Tebby and Rink, and the paper is a, there's two pieces to the paper. One is they're trying to come up with a much more complicated way to do TPPs with all kinds of different documents. Actually, I think that's unnecessary and makes things too complicated. This should be simple. But I did see some points at the beginning of their paper that I thought were worth highlighting to the audience. One is, is that what is an I, a TPP? And, and this is their definition. Uh, provided an eradicable point of reference for the development of a value-added contribution to the therapeutic treatment paradigm. I'll translate it to a reflection of the market needs or a benchmark. There were a couple other points that they made in this uh, introductory part of the paper, and what I think is important, that, you know, as a drug developer, you know, my common thinking is the goal is to get the drug approved. But achieving regulatory approval alone may yield a marketed product, but it may not deliver a return on investment. And then this is pretty much all throughout uh, many of the hits that I saw, is that there's an attempt to mold the TPP to the unfolding properties of the compound, and this must be resisted. At least this is the opinion of Tebby and Rink, and I share it, because it could lead to errant investment into a molecule that will no longer provide a solution to the needs of the market. And my summary of that long statement is the TPP should only be updated when the market conditions changes. So I know there's some folks that don't like TPPs, and here are some of the reasons that I often hear. They stifle discovery. You know, discovery is about a prepared mind and some serendipity. They're useless because they always change, and, and, and that's something that is going to be a real key takeaway I hope you get from my presentation. And then perhaps one of the more ominous ones is there's no way I could deliver that, and, and we know that there are a lot of problems, and we'll have to work on that together. And then if you have an HR department in your company, it might be that I just don't like any of that stuff, and I don't like Mondays. So again, coming from Google and all the hits, some say that the TPP is written by the company developing the treatment, and it had begun early enough, it can help their development work properly focus on the end goal. Check, I'm okay with that. I highlight in green the written by the company because it doesn't have to be written by the company and that'll be another take home point that I'll give you towards the end. 
A TPP can be used as a basis for discussions between the company and those regulatory authorities that will assess the product for release, and it focuses on the label. Though a TPP initially presents the optimal product, it's a dynamic document which can be updated as the drug development program progresses and the knowledge of the drug increases. Now, I'm paraphrasing many of the websites that I found. High up in my hit list, I find an FDA document on target product profiles, how to write one. And I'm not going to read through it. I'm just going to say that, you know, what was the purpose of the FDA issuing this guidance? Well, it came from a working group that they commenced in 2007 between members of FDA and uh, many of the pharmaceutical sponsors. And the idea here was to improve the interactions regarding drug development process and communications between sponsors and FDA. And I'll applaud FDA and plug them for trying to do this over many years. Uh, I think that we, we ought to view them as very interested in our success. But in this guidance document, and this is in the third bullet, we see that dynamic summary that changes as the knowledge of drug gets increased. So this must be a popular concept, and again, it will be one of my uh, take-home messages. Just to be clear, uh, also, and I highlight this in red, that it's not mandatory that you submit a TPP if you meet with the FDA, either in an end of phase two or any other uh, meeting with the sponsors. But much of what's in your TPP and what you're trying to accomplish is will frame your conversations with them. So I'll check the first two bullets and I'll slash the third. It's not a dynamic uh, document. And this last bullet that I captured from the Google hits basically says much of the same thing, but it introduces that the goals should be de developed or that the drug should be developed or the process should unwind with the commercial goals of the product forefront. So it's bringing commercial into it. And in fact, TPPs can be valued. And one should always understand the added value of an innovation. You know, what is the meaningful patient benefits compared to the current standard of care therapies to justify, again, that value-driven reimbursement? So you should ask yourself some of these questions when you're putting together your TPP. How will the new therapy improve patient outcomes compared to standard of care? Are there specific deficiencies with the current standard of care that could be addressed? Improvement in AEs or dosage form. And then what scientific differentiators would need to be evident if the innovation is to be reimbursed and seen as a clinical alternative to standard treatments? The last point I want to make on this slide is that market research can be undertaken to actually place a, a value, a monetary value on a TPP. And the way this is done is called quantitative market research, something I'm not much of an expert on. But it involves trade-offs, where you look at the various attributes in your TPP, and you try to determine which of those attributes is accountable for driving most of that value. And the value could be expressed as your base profile, which is achieving the target attributes. An upside, maybe you hit something that you're lucky and it, it's better than you want to stretch target or a downside where you fail to achieve some of these attributes. And to me, a good example is if you set out to develop an IV oral drug, but you only can get an IV drug, you could do the trade-off analysis and determine which of, whether that's enough to drive your value or was it the oral that actually drove your value. So how do you write a TPP? And we're almost done, actually. Um, the TPP really needs to be developed early probably uh, very early when you really understand the disease area that you want to go into. And it needs to involve just about all of the key players in your team. I'm not going to go through all of this. It's pretty self-evident. Um, I will say, as uh, others have today, that manufacturing should have a role in the TPP. And that's because there's often lead time to deliver clinical material. And uh, the TPP could help the separate functions prioritize their work and communicate where they are in the process of providing this. In big pharma, there's usually an active portfolio management group, and they'll put a net present value on your TPP, much like we do with grants and whatever, and they'll allocate resources uh, across the, a big pharma portfolio in, in R&D. But they also could help frame discussions. And remember, all, of, all these folks should be in early because the buy-in comes from good teamwork and participating in the process. So this is only one example of a template of a TPP. And if you look on the left-hand side, 
you'll see that you know it looks very much like some of the elements in our in our pharma, in our drug labeling. Uh, there's a, a variety of categories, and you could add or subtract many of these, um, but, but typically you'll see a target label, you'll see an indication, you'll see something about efficacy, safety, you'll see something about uh, contraindications, maybe something about drug interactions, certainly formulation, dose, drug what route of administration. So like I said, these can change, and there's plenty of examples that you could find just on a Google search. I think the top's pretty much static. Um, it should be pretty much uh, what you would expect to see, a desired pro profile, a minimally acceptable profile, and you should always include the current gold standard to see how this measures up. Another example that I came across was, was this one, and I just wanted to revisit this dynamic idea behind a TPP. Is this a TPP or an asset profile? When I looked at it, I, I kind of thought it was going to be a TPP, but it reads like an asset profile to me because it's very specific to a single uh, drug. And I actually think an asset profile is a good thing. Now, for this asset, it looks like they're achieving much of what you'd want to achieve in a TPP. So this program's probably a good program, at least at this stage of development. So the last slide of any major content I want to provide is the TPPs coming back to that point about the company writing them. They don't always have to be written by the company. They, they could be written by many uh, groups. And, and, and if you look in the Google search, you'll see, and I have the link for you, that UNICEF has a whole uh, slew of TPPs. And, and, and they're like for rapid diagnostics, for E. coli or Zika, or for emergency structures or certain types of tents that they could use uh, to house and to st uh, for their staff that gets deployed to remote uh, regions. WHO has one for uh, tuberculosis diagnostics. In fact, if you go back to the pre-World War II, the British Air Ministry listed specifications for a warplane, and it yielded the uh, famous Spitfire. And probably more close to our heart and, and, and with the theme of some of the things they'll probably talk about during the week, is that there's a lot of issues on trying to improve the economics of, of the uh, antibacterial uh, world right now, and there's a lot of discussions around pool incentives. And one such pool incentive is if you meet a certain set of criteria, you could get a market entry award. So we may see governments issuing a TPP that define the attributes or eligibility requirements for attainment of a market entry award. So in conclusion, TPPs are strategic documents that describe the desired attributes of a product. Yes, they're a commercial tool. Achieving the TPP is necessary for commercial success and thereby serves as the guide for determining asset value and capital spending. It's not a dynamic document and should not change. And in the future, TPPs could be issued by governments. Thank you. Okay, so now instead of having the intermediate panel discussion, I'm gonna, we'll go straight to the questions and answers. Um, you've given us a bunch of them. Uh, some of them I have no idea what the answers are. And we can talk about them. You know, maybe I can tell you who to, who to speak to about that. Uh, there are a bunch on resistance that I'm gonna try to just stick together. And we've got a couple more. Um, here's one for John. What happened to that one that I just put up here? Good, okay. All right. Um, yeah, you want to try yeah, that so, one? So, uh, again, I don't usually speak on, on TPPs or commercial issues, but here the question is, one always hears of net present value. What are some examples of net present value cal calculation factors? Um, so this is a term where, and, and John Rex probably knows more, if Kevin Outerson was here, he could probably do a better job justice to this, but this is a way of calculating today what an asset is worth. Uh, not necessarily what the asset would be worth uh, at the end, but some of the factors probably incorporate your development costs, the time, lost opportunity costs. It gets more complicated than that, things like hurdle rates and whatever. But it's, it's commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry and largely in big pharma to uh, try to get an idea of whether or not what you have today is really worth developing. So you like to see your net present value positive and not negative, and the bigger the number, the better. There was an interesting publication that came out a number of years ago th from the Eastern 
research group, which they actually looked at NPVs from a different perspective. Like if you have uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, what would be the value of an NPV from the patient's perspective? Uh, and, it, and it was clear that there was a mismatch between things that reflect the NPV of an antibiotic in early development versus the ultimate societal need for patients. And I think that's a driver of a lot of the discussions trying to balance and rebalance the economic issues in antibacterial. So that's the best I could do with that one. Okay, I'll answer a few uh, that came here on resistance, and then I'll pass it on to others. Uh, what if you hit one target and nothing else? How does this have an impact on the resistance ratios, resistance rates? Uh, for example, C-beta-lactams. Well, this is something that I've been talking about for 25 years. Uh, basically, I believe that if you hit one single target, you have a very high possibility of getting high rates of resistance, the kind that give you a high fold increase in MIC. Uh, if you have a single target. And so, um, as I'll give a talk at the end of the week, <laughs> uh, to mention that it seems that the best antibiotics do have pleiotropic effects. They hit more than one target or targets that are encoded by multiple genes or, or a pathway rather than single enzymes. You can use them, but usually they're used in combination or topically or against TB, but not against, say, staph. So, in fact, if you do ha hit one target, you will get, and I'll go into that at some level, uh, a high frequency of resistance that gives you a high, a high MIC. And that's basically, if that's a fit mutant, it's probably going to be a problem in, in the clinic, and it's, there are not going to be any very easy ways of getting around that, except possibly in combinations, which you can talk about. They mentioned here beta-lactams, but beta-lactams hit more than one target. They hit many PBPs, at least two in every species. There are some beta-lactams that only hit one, like mycillinam, and that actually does give you a reasonably high rate of resistance. So if you hit multiple targets, multiple, even similar ones, that can change the ultimate rate of resistance, if anyone wants to chime in. Um, what's the accepted fold MIC uh, for determining resistance frequency? Basically, you do a, a dilution series. You say two-fold, 2x, 4x, 8x, et cetera, and you go up to the limit and you say above 8x, I don't find any resistance. And that's the um, maximum, <laughs> the MPC, the um, mutant, prevention. mutant prevention concentration. Thank you, my head is gone. So that's what you want to determine. If you have a resistance frequency that's relatively low, 2, 2x or 4x, and you can't get things above you know, 8x, 8x or above, it means that, as Tom had mentioned, uh, that's not too high a, a fold MIC, and you should be able or possibly are able to dose above that. So that's important. That means that if it doesn't go up very high, if your fold doesn't go up very high, then you might be able to dose above it, and that's going to be related to uh, if they're fit in vivo, the, the, the mutant bugs, and how much you can get in, you know, the toxicity. If you're low tox and you can dose at a high level and you get it to the right site, you may be able to overcome that. That's what's seen often with uh, C. difficile drugs, where um, even though they have a, some of them have high frequency of resistance, you can put so much in the gut that's, that, that sort of overcomes the resistance. So that's one way of looking at it. Um, how, how do in vitro resistance and in vivo in a clinic resistance relate? That's really, as I try to mention, is a hard question. We don't have good models where we can say in vitro is this, hence the minus ninth. In vivo, it's this, uh, because it's hard to do those animal studies to get an answer. Um, and sometimes you just get to the clinic and you see what happens. But that really hasn't happened too much. Um, it's mostly that we try to predict it in vitro. And most things don't go into the clinic if they have a, rel a reasonably high resistance rate. People are scared of that now. So um, I, I don't think we have a good handle on if you're in the, the low frequency range, 10 to the minus ninth, and you have a low, but, but if you have a high fold MIC, I worry about that. Others might not. So Lynn, yeah, do, do, you think, do you think that <laughs> comment you made, is that relate to fitness? Is that a fitness issue? Because the, ex the way I met Lynn uh, was at a Gordon Research co Conference when I presented the re results of a $14 million experiment. Yes. And fortunately, I only spent about $2 million proving that what 
one would predict from in vitro and what Lynn wrote about a year or so before actually occurs overnight in a UTI study where I found three organisms that were resistant to a single target agent in the clinic. Right. So, so it turns out because those kinds of mutants, at least the ones that were published on, were quite fit. So those mutants, which were, I think, at least it seems like, pre-existing in the population before, before even seeing the drug, once selected, they grew up. And the um, ho hollow fiber experiments thereafter showed that that seemed to be true for your, for your drug. And, and I th that's what I worry about. But that's, in fact, the, the one real evidence from the clinic that single targets are, could be problematic. And I think that's where it's, you know, after I've been saying that for many years, that was the first sort of <laughs> indication it might be true. So I, I worry about that. The thing is that in many cases you find you get a resistant mutant you know, on, the, on a petri dish, but it turns out those are really slow growing and maybe they won't live, but it turns out also if you look in vivo, maybe they're fine. And that's the problem. We don't, you have to look in many places to see what do you think is gonna happen. And I think most of us have been pretty careful or you know not going forward into the clinic if there's a worry but I'd like to get a better handle on that okay maybe one more um, can a dose level above the MIC make up for a spontaneous mutant frequency that's high as I mentioned yes if you can reach uh, the MPC the um, mutant prevention concentration in vivo hopefully that's going to help you say with quinolones where it was invented but also in other in other cases um, Others are on methodology of testing. I'm not going to go into that. Okay. And one other question that I had of interest. Ah, this is, I think, an important way other, others can go on. Do you pursue breadth of spectrum first, or do you choose potency first? And I think what, I think as Tom illustrated and we all are getting at, you basically have to measure as many things as you can up front. You do a structure activity relationship or in, in uh, trying to optimize your leads, you have to look at as many parameters as you can. As a biologist, that's what I worry about. So it used to be that I'd come, come to a meeting with chemists and they were just looking at MICs, but I would say, wait a minute, let's look at you know, uh, as many different parameters as you can up front and then see, see the, the trends. Because I don't think there's a way of, I mean, if you go for potency all the way, and I guess Tim can <laughs> has sort of said this, if you really go for potency at the target, which is more straightforward, and chemists love to do that, uh, then you might lose permeability altogether. And so you, you have to look at as many parts of it as you can. Anyone else want to? Please do. I think the other thing you have to keep in mind with that is what's your ultimate goal? If you're going for community acquired yeah. pneumonia, for example, which is what I was illustrating there, you have to capture certain organisms. Um, the FDA does not use the Chinese menu uh, kind of approach where you can pick from different columns. Um, there's certain organisms you have to cover. Also, if you're gonna go in the lung, you're gonna have to get reasonably high levels in the lung. This is why macrolides, for example, tend to uh, partition into lung tissue better than, than other classes. So it, it's highly variable depending on what your ultimate goal is, and that ties into the TPP. What, what exactly are you trying to address? If you have a compound that is very potent against gram negatives but doesn't end up being significantly concentrated in urine or kidneys, then you're not going to go after CUTI with something like that. So it, it, there's a lot of variables there, I think, that you have to be aware of. If you're going to go after CUTI, there's certain organisms you have to cover and you have to have uh, levels high enough in the kidney and the urine to cover those organisms. So your mileage may vary. That kind of segues actually into one of the oh, questions that, that okay, I had, good. which is what do you need from biologists to improve selectivity? So as Lynn mentioned, we're very focused on potency. We've kind of learned our lesson about that and we're trying to preserve properties, but we are good at optimizing whatever we can measure. So medicinal chemistry is done iteratively. We make a set of compounds, we test them in assays, and then we make a different set based on the results that we get. So what we need from biologists 
are all the assays for the types of selectivity we care about that can be done high throughput on small amounts of compound because we will initially make only one or two milligrams so and maybe we'll make 50 compounds so if your assay for the thing that we need to be selective against will take 50 compounds and only needs 0.1 milligram of compound then we can very quickly get to the bottom of that because we can test every compound in it if your assay only takes five compounds and needs five milligrams of compound it's going to be a lot harder to figure that issue out so that's what we need Okay. And was that the question you had? I, I forgot what question I handed to you. Okay. Um, and did you have, what was the question I Oh, the question yeah, I got yeah, here sorry. was, <laughs> uh, with gyrus discon discontinued, any lessons learned? The problem <laughs> with very late failures is you never see them coming. Um, there was another program I was involved in, which was a ketolide program at um, Pfizer. And we got into phase one. And what we saw was a sneak metabolic pathway that destroyed the molecule that did not exist in dogs, did not exist in cyanomoglus monkeys, did not exist in rats, did not exist in mice. How do you see that coming? You don't. Um, so, you know, what would you do differently? Uh, when you get into man, uh, people are not oversized rats, at least most of them aren't. And, um, so you really, these things happen. It's just part of it. And it's very disappointing because you're usually at the end of four or five years of very hard work and you've checked all the boxes you need to check, both for your team and for the FDA. And these things just happen. So what would I do differently? Um, well, uh, vodka tonic gives you less headaches than gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> is it all luck? Yes. Is it, is is it, it all, all luck? luck? We, got, we got the question. Napoleon so, said, I would rather have a general who is lucky than good. Is it all luck is the question. No. It is no. not all luck. No. But, but luck does play an important right. if role. If you're not lucky, that's, you're in big trouble. Okay. But, yeah, uh, I have one. How many multi-target opportunities are there? <laughs> and that's a good question. In fact, we don't know of too many. We know of the topoisomerases. Um, and the penicillin binding proteins, that's the ones that we have out there. Um, there are other possibilities like the purine pathway. Uh, Mir CD. What? Mir CD. Mir CD, yes, the Mir ligases, but no one's really successfully gotten all of those. Um, you know, so there's many that we know where it looks like there's similar active site motifs and that ought to be amenable to uh, inhibition. The Mir pathway compounds, I think the problem there, the ones in the, the cytoplasmic, the ligases, are that the active sites are looking for quite polar phosphate kind of things, and the analogs you get are mostly rodenines, and so <laughs> you find sort of crap, and, and nothing gets into the cells, and I think that's one of the big problems with that set of targets. There might be ways around it, so we'll see, but uh, that's people have worked on those for years and years and years. And the other idea is that I've, I've always thought that this is an area that's really open for bioinformatics and chemioinformatics to look for ligand bind, sort of find out if they're ligands that bind to multiple sites that we're just not thinking of. But I don't know. Other yeah, thoughts? Yeah, Lynn, I just want to ask my co-panelists. Um, some folks have tried linking two different type of antibiotics right. together to hit two targets. What, what are your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I thought that was sounded like a good idea in the beginning if it made sense. Some of the earliest ones from Roche, et cetera, which were, um, I mean, were beta lactams plus, I forget what they were, uh, quinolones. Yes. quinolones. And, and basically that didn't really make sense. They were inside and outside. And the point was, I thought maybe it would be useful to have something that you both had two things targeted to the same place and maybe that would work. And it's fine in sense. So there are a couple of those that are, that are in the pipeline mostly for C. diff because what happens is they get big. And so you're, you're basically now gram positive compounds which are not as needed as much because we were quite successful in making all the MRSA kind of compounds, which, you know, so I think they would have a, a possibility. It's harder for gram negatives, just because size is really important. Um, but it's not a crazy idea. So, so you might have, if you have two small pharmacophores that you might be able to direct, there's nothing I think wrong with that, although I know people have argued. Do you want to? So what I would say about this is it seems, it seems like it's almost a way to trick the regulators because if you have two things that are tethered together but are operating independently, why not just dose a combination 
which is probably long overdue in the antibacterial space. It's common in cancer, it's called, common in antiviruses. The reason would be that in, in case someone just takes one and doesn't take the other, right? So you worry about that. But if you had perfect compliance and you were able to dose the two separate agents, I don't see how that, that wouldn't be just as good as a link. Well, because it's not only compliance, it's also the PK of the compounds. And so... Well, you dose it, well, you would dose it in a, in a way that you would cover. But if you link you would, together, that would be... Yes. Yeah, but all you, of these you're not are, guaranteed to solve your PK problem with the link because you no, can no. have different... No, that's all all of that is true. Right, yeah, and I right. think combinations are, I think, a way that has to be seriously explored from now on. And it hasn't been. And there's a lot of questions, both in the basic sciences and the basic uh, experimentation to, to show that it works, even though it obviously works that if you are, <laughs> have a, a high resistance frequency to two different compounds and you dose them together, yes, you don't get such high, high frequency of resistance. You know that. But is that something that will work in an animal? It works with TB. That's how TB is treated. Historically, that's why TB was treated, or HIV, or HCV. So it works there. The question is, are rapidly growing bacteria going to be subject to and treatable in combinations? And then is there a regulatory pathway for doing this? Yeah, let me comment just quick on this, that yeah. one of the reasons that uh, this hasn't been adequately explored is the regulatory process. I yeah. mean, you're trying to prevent resistance, but you're not going to see resistance that often in your clinical trial to Correct. be able to show that that actually impacts your outcome endpoints. So, you know, David and others have been at tons of ASM meetings where there have been talks about do we need monotherapy or combination yeah. therapy for clinical outcomes. And, you know, I don't know how fully resolved that question is, but it is hard to prove the value in a, in a clinical trial. So there should be ways of, of testing that, and uh, I leave it to John Rex to tell me how to do it, um, or others. But it's something that I think is we have to figure out how to try this. Um, other so, questions? Yes, yeah. you've got an interesting thought here. Absolutely. I have one question that Ryan Sertz can answer. <laughs> yes. How often do antimicrobials induce error-prone replication? Ryan? <laughs> yes. Since he did his thesis on this. Sure. Well, no, I specifically <laughs> studied the quinolones. I mean, I guess. Well, you did riff. You did a few. Yeah. So um, it depends sometimes. <laughs> I mean, basically, if they cause buildup of single-stranded DNA, then you'll get RECA polymerization and activation. So I mean, obviously, the quinolones and, the, and other DNA replication inhibitors are, are clear examples. There's some other more intricate work showing coupling of beta-lactam uh, inhibition of PVPs and how that eventually translates into induction. But I think still classically, the quinolones are sort of the the right. ultimate uh, activators and mobilizers of all these plasmids and probably why we saw the ESBLs grow so fast in the last decade. Okay. <clears throat> Other thoughts? Oh, I can't do this one. Um, there's some toxicology questions which I, I have no knowledge of. Uh, oh, in vitro testing doesn't really uh, address or doesn't mimic the environment in which the drugs will be used. And how does that influence, you know, how we're going to be testing things? And I think this is a really critical and important question, which people are starting to realize now. You know, you do an MIC, even in different media, you can get different answers. And I think that's really critical. We have to take, learn more about what's going on. We don't know what the medium is in the human in most cases. So it's very hard to show that. Even to know if you have, there are some experiments that have been done. Well, I mentioned the purine pathway might be a good target. Well, purine, if you, you know, you can feed purines, and most of the time in vitro, these bugs will grow. So you don't want to inhibit the purine pathway. But it turns out in, <clears throat> in humans, or animals even, um, you can't feed enough purines to overcome purine oxytrophy. So it's possible that that's a reasonable target in vivo. And I think that's the kind of thing. We need to know more physiology. We need to know a lot more questions. <clears throat> and so, uh, until, well, I'll say recently, but the whole idea of using oxytrophs, that is trying to uh, inhibit standard me metabolic pathways, is not usually what you'll do because you figure, you know, the um, essential amino acids in humans are going to be fed. So you're going to be feeding to the bacterium also. So you don't do, you don't look for an arginine inhibitor. But it may be that that's something that you can't feed too well. Anyway, so it's important to look at those essentials. Do you want to take this yes, one? you okay. take it. Okay. You take Here's it away. One for you. 
not me. Oh. Okay, so we have a question here on what mammalian cell types should be used for toxicity. Usually, there, there's a couple of cell lines that are used, HEP-G2, uh, A549, A things of that nature. Um, one of the things you have to keep in mind with all this kind of testing, though, is something Tim just touched upon a few moments ago. You only have a finite amount of material that is synthesized in, in a program. Once you think you've got something that looks like it has some legs to it, then you get a larger batch, 50 or 100 megs made, and then you can do a much larger extent of testing. Um, for example, you can put it into something like a uh, syrup panel, things of that nature. But initially, when you're in the early stages of the program, the amount of compound you get is often very, very small. So you have to, as a, as a team, sit there and say, what's going to be the most valuable assays for us to run? Now, mammalian cells are valuable, and they don't take a lot of compound, but you can't run a whole um, battery of these. The other thing that often uh, people run is microsomal uh, enzyme assays to look for uh, degradation of the compound. That's another one that requires relatively little compound. But there's that balance between getting enough information out of a minimal amount of compound. So you, you do have to, as a team, make those kinds of decisions. So one of the reasons to use liver cells is that uh, drugs are concentrated in the liver and hepatotoxicity is often a driver. But liver also metabolizes drugs, sometimes into bioactive compounds that can form covalent bonds. So liver metabolism can create a toxic compound where you didn't start with one. And so that's why it's important to use the hep, hep cells and all that. Okay. Take all right, up? I have one more uh, sort of <clears throat> a challenge. Development of multi-targeted drugs may lead to multi-target resistance and superbugs and no more alternative drugs, correct? Um, okay, yes, but also um, most of our good drugs, the ones that, as I've mentioned, do have multiple targets. You don't get resistance that's target-based. You get mostly the resistance that's come from horizontal transfer of resistance alleles. And so the multi-drug resistance, we certainly get efflux resistance in Pseudomonas and in other, other, certain other bacteria, but not all. And, um, and so it's not the same mutational resistance that I'm talking about with single targets. It's, it's generally, that is high level mutational rapid resistance. Eventually you're going to get resistance that comes up all over and also through horizontal transmission. I don't know what to say. Go through, you know, even vaccines are going to give you resistance at some level, so we don't know the answer. Yes, it's, it's an ongoing fight, and if we ever figured out how to do it, we would all have jobs, but not. <laughs> Lots of ways to get scared. I want to thank our panel for a good discussion and thank all of you for being here. This is, could yeah, be the start you. of a really extraordinary three-day course in antibacterial discovery. This was a great way to kick it off. There's coffee and cookies in the back. You've got until 10 past the hour. Thank you. Okay,